Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is John Heerdink. I'm the founder and member of uh, Tribe, uh, managing member of Tribe Public, uh, based here in San Francisco. As many of you know, and hopefully many of you discover today, we're a platform that enables investors to gain direct corporate access uh, to the leaders of companies uh, that they care about. Um, we do that through a wish list process uh, where you can simply submit the names of leaders and companies that uh, primarily trade in the New York uh, Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, but we're really open to everyone as we've had uh, a Nobel Peace Prize winner in, in medicine on the, on the program and others. So uh, look, at it, look at it as a platform and a way to get in front of, of folks you want to learn from and leaders of industry that you might uh, look to invest in. Uh, we have members that have joined us from over 27 countries, um, every little spot in, in the U.S., and we are also back to doing live events where we host these leaders in your tribe city, as we call them, as you become a member of the tribe and have a group of tribe members in your area that want to meet and to learn even and ask the questions that you, that you want to learn uh, about these companies and sectors and products, et cetera. Um, through either luncheons, uh, dinner events, or even speaking engagements. If you have an ongoing uh, uh, meeting place, then we can sometimes piggyback on top of that. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, please uh, view our website, tribepublic, T-R-I-B-E, uh, -B -E, uh, public.com, uh, for a list of disclaimers. Note that I'm a shareholder of this uh, company, uh, Modular Medical, NASDAQ, M-O-D-D, that we have the CEO, uh, Jeb Besser, on today, and he's going to be talking about uh, how uh, his company is going to help us uh, revolutionize uh, diabetes care and, and why that is so important. Um, note that I'm not acting as an investment advisor in, in this capacity today, and that if you're not an advisor, please consult one before making any investment decisions on this company or otherwise. Um, also note that I am a managing director of Vista Partners, which is a California registered investment advisor, also based in San Francisco. And its website is vistapglobal.com. And uh, also take a look at its listed disclaimers to be a fair evidence. And uh, note that I uh, we create content there about uh, NVIDIA, uh, Modular Medical, and many other companies that you might be interested in. Um, I would also like to thank you all for participating and for sending the questions that you've already sent and note that you can send some additional questions and we'll try to get them addressed today in our short format of about 30 minutes uh, for uh, questions for Jeb Besser today uh, through the Zoom chat feature. And I'll do my best to, to get those in front of them. Uh, now let's get started. Uh, Jeb, um, uh, please uh, introduce yourself and, and Modular Medical. And again, the symbol is uh, NASDAQ M-O-D-D. And uh, if you will, uh, after that, pull up your presentation. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming today. Great. All right. Thanks, John. I appreciate the introduction and thanks for, uh, thanks for having us on again. Um, so uh, let's let's talk about modular medical and how it's revolutionizing diabetes care, uh, care for people with diabetes. Uh, the company was founded by Paul DePerna, who founded Tandem Diabetes, ticker TNDM, which is listed on the NASDAQ and was the last major successful entrant into the insulin pump space. Um, we think we're addressing an initial $3 billion unmet market need. Uh, we submitted our product for clearance to the FDA on January 19th of 2024. So we are on the clock with the FDA now, and I'll talk some more about how that process works and, and what the ins and outs are of when and how we might potentially get cleared. And we're based in San Diego. So why is there a need to revolutionize diabetes care for people who require daily insulin? Well, for, in order to understand that, you have to understand that insulin pumps are the gold standard of care for anyone that requires daily insulin. They are because they give you two things that multiple daily injections with insulin can never give you. They can give you a slow basal drip all day long for half of your insulin, like a person without diabetes would get from their pancreas. And that keeps them closer to baseline. And then they give you the ability to push a button and give yourself a bolus pre-meal time or pre other events that might cause your insulin to spike or it might cause your blood sugar to spike. And that 
ability rather than excusing yourself and going and injecting yourself with needles in a bathroom or or some other place means that you're going to bolus more frequently and in smaller amounts. And if you do that, you also stay closer to baseline. And we know that the diabetic retinopathy, the diabetic foot ulcers, the cardiovascular side effects, these other things that all happen with long use of insulin to manage diabetes happens because of these huge excursions. So pumps are better care. There's such better care that they save the healthcare system $10,000 a year per patient, including a $5,000 placeholder for a pump. So you would think that the insurance companies would be all over encouraging patients to use this, use these products, but they are not because the current products from Medtronic, Tandem, and Insulate are for many patients too cumbersome, too costly, and too complex for them. And so they've resisted adopting technology. If you're willing to spend the 30 to 60 minutes a day required right now to manage one of these one of the current devices, you can get excellent care. It's it's very comparable to, I, I like the coffee analogy. It's very comparable to the coffee analogy where you can have a $2,000 latte machine on your kitchen counter, which provides you with a great cup of coffee if you turn all the knobs and all the levers just right. But most people have a Keurig because it gives you 85 to 90% of the benefit for 10% of the work. There's no product out there like that in the insulin pump space right now. And that is why even though pumps have been on the market since 1996, only 30, you know, high 30s percent of type one people with type one diabetes are on a pump. And that number is substantially un is up only marginally since 2006. And the number of type twos who require daily insulin is about 10 percent up from zero 20 years ago. But that still means nine out of 10 people with type two diabetes who require daily insulin are not on a pump. And the people who have adopted a pump are the people who probably already were getting very good care with needles because they were so diligent, because they were so organized, because they were well-educated and well-informed and well-reimbursed. And that's proven by the last stat on this slide. 21% of type ones two years ago were making their ADA target. That number is the same as 2006. So we haven't moved the major piece in the middle. We think that the only way to do that is to introduce easier to use, more available technology. So the first pushback I usually get on this is, well, no, you're not right on that because it's simply that many patients simply refuse to wear anything at all on their body. And the problem with that thesis is that there's another device, a continuous glucose monitor that allows you to see in real time what your blood sugar levels are. Um, that is also worn all the time in order to get better results with your diabetes. And it turns out that the penetration of CGMs is almost four times as great as pumps. Why? What's so different? Why are four times as many people willing to wear a CGM as a pump? We think it's because of this, this product. The Abbott Freestyle Libre, which was introduced in 2016. And when it was introduced, the key opinion leaders in this space all said, you know what? No one's going to want this poor man's version of Dexcom. Dexcom had come on the market six years earlier and had taken a ton of market share from Medtronic and Roche, who were the current incumbents with a smaller, better, much more feature-rich product. And Libre was less accurate and didn't offer a real-time feed like Dexcom. It didn't have the alarms like Dexcom. It didn't allow you to see your family to see in real time what your numbers were. And it required Dexcom at the time required a finger stick to calibrate and Libre didn't. But the KOL said people with diabetes prick themselves all the time. So why should they care about that in, in, if you're going to get much better accuracy? Well, you can see from the chart. Five years after introduction, Libre had as many has had as much revenue and had as many users as Dexcom. But Dexcom kept growing too because they're fundamentally different audiences. The Dexcom audience looks much like the current pump audience. I work hard and I get great results with my diabetes. The Freestyle Libre crowd says things like, I love this product because it makes my life easier. I wave the wand, I see my number, and I know what... Um, and I know what it is, and I can use that to dose myself appropriately. The lack of features for them were features. They didn't want their family knowing what their numbers were in real time. They don't want the alarms going off and having people judging them for being a person with diabetes. They don't want any of those things. So they just want to know their number. And now we think that the Libre users are coming back to their doctor after five years and saying, you know what? I see how bad my numbers are. I want to do better. But I know how much work it is to be on the current three pumps. And I'm not doing that. What do you have for me? And since 2011, when the uh, 
when the tandem T-slim was introduced, the answer has basically been, I have nothing for you. Try harder, be smarter. That's not a very satisfying answer. So do the doctors agree with this basic thesis? We surveyed 10% of the endocrinologists in the United States and endocrinologists and nurse diabetes educators. And we asked them, what percentage of your multiple daily injectors, not your current pump users, we're not trying to take people who are happy with their current pumps and switch them onto our platform. We're trying to take people who have rejected the current pumps for 13 years. And what percentage of your MDIs would you prescribe a pump to that would have, that was easier to learn, less full featured, less bells and whistles, less expensive. And they said one in four. And so that's how we get our, one at, that's how we get our three billion dollar market size. But they don't just say one in four. They usually list off ten to twenty people that come into their practice on a regular basis who they see who have said, "I who've raised their hand and said, I want to pump butt," and that butt could be related to size of the insulin reservoir. It might be related to being confused about the functionality. It might be related to concerns about adhesive. It might be form factor. It might be a bunch of, it might be a combination of all of those things. But these are self-identified people who have said, I want to go on a pump. So we think that they would be fairly easy to access. Then we surveyed thousands of multiple daily injectors and said, would you ever consider going on a pump? 45% said, yes, I would go on a pump. You have to make it easy for me to learn. You have to make it easy for my doctor to prescribe. You have to make it easy to get reimbursement coverage. And the bottom line is, if it's more than 10 minutes a day, I'm not doing it and it doesn't matter what happens to me 15 or 20 years down the road. I'm already too overburdened by my diabetes. So you have to bring the product to the patient. And that's what we've tried to do with this, the Mod 1, insulin delivery for almost pumpers. And so what are the key features that the almost pumpers told us that they want? The first thing they said was they absolutely do not want to carry a second device. Most insulate users, and if you've never seen an insulate Omnipod, this is the pod, very similar in overall volume to ours, but you don't get this without this second lockdown cell phone or a cell phone that's a few generations behind because the FDA insists on approving every cell phone individually. So you, if you're happy with a cell phone that where the apps never update and uh, it does have your phone number, but it's definitely not your iPhone 15 Pro, then perhaps you can get away with having your own device. But in general, it's a second lockdown cell phone. And if this doesn't work, if this isn't charged, this doesn't work at all either. So people don't like having a second device. They wanna be able to do everything they need to do with the device just by pushing a button. And that's what you can do with ours. This is our 90 day reusable. Push the button, it does everything you need to do with this device. That in of itself, not having anything else that you need to do, no, not having complicated controls, having only basically four features, that's, that is revolutionary. And if you see how easy this is to use, this is an eight step process every three days to change the cartridge. This is our disposable, this is our reusable, we give you this for free. This clicks together like this and the light comes on. Then you, you slide it together. You fill it up with insulin before you click it together. This is an eight step process and one of the steps is is the light on? And one of the steps is, did you wash your hands? So that is very, very, it's very approachable. It's about the complexity of a McDonald's Happy Meal. There if you've you ever put one of those together. I so 90 day reusable I, pump. I, I think even I could probably do that. And I think it was, uh, was interesting for some of you. I've seen some of the names that are people on here. And I think some of you actually had the pleasure of meeting Jeb uh, out in Arizona when we had him at one of the tribe events. And he, and he had the products out on the table, had actually passed around. And, um, you know, everyone was amazed at how simple this product is around the table, um, uh, you know, out in Scottsdale and then out in Peoria. So anyway, they keep telling me about, you know, how simple that was as a base and how sleek, simple, easy to use it. They, if they were in that position, it would probably be their choice. Well, I th look, I think, I think simplicity and eliminating hassles is the name of the game in terms of driving new people to adopt, new people to adopt technology. And the other thing is, if you look at the other devices, so this is the Tandem T-Slim. This is the product that our founder, Paul, invented when he was at Tandem. And the insides of this are pretty much what he invented today. Um, and it's got a nice touch screen, but this touch screen works about 1300 user configurable options. And this product requires you to charge it while it's on your body at night, which a lot of people dislike. And this has 48 inches of tubing that goes into your abdomen and the product itself sits in your pocket or on your belt or on your thigh. And it's like that for the rest of your life. This is the Medtronic Mini Med. 
This is 48, the 48 inches of tubing. Here's the interface. This is where the AA batteries go. This whole thing comes off and you do a 42 step process to change the cartridge inside this and you do that every three days. This is a substantial burden and a very complex product. And look, you've taken the time to learn how to use this. You can get great care, but most people have not. And there's a, and there are good reasons for that, right? Like this, it, this is just screaming for another option for people who have, want to spend a little bit less time managing their diabetes and a little bit more time living their life. Um, yeah, I mean, so a lot of people like this. A lot of people like this form factor, but there are major issues with this as well. Issue number one, you can't take this off. Once you stick this to your arm or your abdomen, you are committed and you fire that auto injector. You are committed to this for three days. If you take it off, it's garbage and you lose all the insulin inside as well. It also only holds two mLs of insulin. Ours holds three. So does Tandem and Medtronic. 25% of all type ones and 65% of all type twos need three mLs to get through two to get through three days. In that and that product. Jeb, the product you're holding, which one is that again? Just to That's remind. the Insulin Omnipod. Thank you. Ticker PODD yeah. uh, trades at eight to 10 times revenues, depending on how nervous people are about GLP-1s on a given day. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, um, so so this this is the one that's been taking most, most share recently, even though it was introduced way back in 2009. Hmm. So, uh, but, and we can talk about the other reason why they're taking share in a second, but people seem to like this form factor. And in fact, our volume is almost the same as theirs, but we, um, you know, we are removable and that's a huge difference. The different difference with it, and there's another practical issue with this is, which is the injection site is underneath the device. And if you, in most likely place, you're going to get an occlusion or a blockage when you're pumping insulin is at the point of injection. And the point of injection in this case is underneath the device. And therefore, how are you going to clear it? Oh, you're going to have to lift it up. If you lift it up, it's garbage. Why do you even bother? So people want, people want that the ability to clear a jam. They want the removability. And so ours, if you look at how it works, so you click it together, it clicks into an adhesive patch, but the adhesive patch doesn't have to be as strong as the Omnipod, which is important because the adhesive under an, under an Omnipod is so strong that we think that 20% of patients approximately get dermatitis, some form of dermatitis and discomfort. And if you have thin skin, taking it off can be painful. So we try to alleviate that issue by allowing you to use a pad, click it in, and then use the needle set next to it. There's a video on our website of someone putting this on. So you just click this on, and then if there's an occlusion, you unclick, throw away the needle set, and then click it onto a slightly different, put insert another site, and then click it on. Um, and then, now, that has practical advantages, but it has psychological advantages, too. There are a lot of things that sometimes you don't want to wear an insulin pump for. Maybe, even if it is waterproof, or water resistant, you don't necessarily want to wear it swimming with that adhesive on the arm. You don't necessarily want to wear it playing tennis. You don't necessarily, you might want just a break for a little while. And some people have expressed to us, hey, I don't want to go on a date and have the first 30 minutes of the conversation be about my diabetes. I want to be talking about things that are actually, that are super important to me besides, besides this. So being able to put it on pause is important. So those are the those are some of the basic features that allow us to be simpler and more accessible. But I don't. But in terms of being revolutionary, I don't want anyone to leave this conversation thinking that we are inferior in the way that we pump insulin. We are just as, if not more, accurate than the leading pumps in terms of the way we pump insulin. Although I don't view that as an important enough commercial claim to ever risk a clinical trial on. I think we are we are at least as accurate. We have Bluetooth. We have NFC. And we pump insulin in a fundamentally different way than they do. We use, we manipulate a thin film to slowly move insulin into an intermediate chamber. And then we pull from that chamber at a, at a rate about, about every 30 seconds. The other pumps generally pull every five minutes. So they're pulling 10 times as much insulin. So we have 10 tries to get the same accuracy that they do. And we're exposing you to less than the 10th of the insulin each time we pulse. And we pump with, we pump with negative pressure. The FDA's biggest fear with these products is that they fail open because if an open reservoir of two to three mLs of insulin goes into your body, you're dead in two minutes. No comebacks. So they are terrified of that. So they demand no human trials, all engineering, stress, and torture tests to make sure that you can't fail open and that you pump accurately. 
So we think we're just as accurate. We have NFC, we have Bluetooth, we have all the features that you would want. If you wanted to make this a super complicated interface, if you wanted to make this a product like the Omnipod, you could do it. But we've chosen to make it a simpler interface to address this radically underserved population of almost pumpers. Okay. What else makes us, so we've covered a lot of this. What makes us different? We pump with negative pressure. If our pump fails, it pulls insulin out of the cam, out of the, out of the cannula and back into the intermediate chamber and back into the reservoir, away from the patient. If cleared, it would be one, among the safest kinds of pumping available. And we pump, pump in smaller increments. But why is this hard? Because you're buying the insulin separately and you're injecting it into the pump. Well, pumping insulin, even though there's no human trial, is an extremely nasty problem. It's nasty because you're pumping at smaller than a 200th of a drop at nanoliter type levels with about 5% accuracy. You have to, you're pumping with 5% accuracy. You can't agitate the mixture too much because the main preservative in the insulin is zinc and zinc-based mixtures clump like crazy when agitated. Most, the other preservatives leach into most kinds of plastic. So a lot of materials are unavailable to you and you have to do it all at a cost and in a size, fact, and a size factor that people can actually wear. So you can't patent pumping insulin, but we have eight families of patents on the way that we pump insulin in a safer fashion. We have eight families of patents on e uh, various forms of e various things we've done to make the product easier to use and more patient friendly. So, sorry, John, you have a question? No, I, I, I would assume, and maybe you're gonna go into this, but this, this really gives sort of a, a platform nature to your, to your company, right? With this. Yes. Uh, yes, that's that's right. Yeah, now this is like product one is designed to be all what we're showing the FDA with product one is a simple interface to address a different customer base than the current product and get them to pass on our novel method of moving insulin. Once we do that, there's no reason that we can't pivot into drug delivery like Insulate does with Amgen on Pro. There's no reason we can't pivot into um, doing a dual chamber, you know, artificial pancreas, which I'll try and address a little bit later. Um, there's no reason that we can't do lots of other things that might be exciting to the market, but nothing has as easy, well, not easy, nothing has as clear a clearance pathway as a single chamber insulin pump for our technology. So that's where we've gone first. Yeah. Right. Hope that answers the question. All right, so so we've talked about so we have eight families of patents around the way that we move insulin. We think it's safer, but also it's lower cost, and cost is really important in this market. And we think that's that's really hindered adoption as well because current pumps were all designed in 1995, 2001, and 2006, 2007, respectively, and the world has changed a lot since then. I'm automated lights out high volume manufacturing has taken great steps forward and there are there's there are pieces of equipment from cell phones and drones that simply didn't exist back then that we've repurposed to use in our product so we claim on here a 50 percent lower cost of goods than the leading patch pump and that's these guys for two reasons one is that we reuse some of the key electronics so while they might do 1.2 billion in revs in this product we think that we have more scale than them because we benefit from the scale of cell phones and drones, the most optimized consumer electronic supply chain the world has ever seen. And we also reuse the pump every 90 days rather than throwing it away every, for 90 days rather than throwing it away every three days. So uh, more on this exact topic. So on the left is a cross section of this. And it has, and you can see it's got 75 discrete components, some analog, some digital, some put in place with tweezers still, some put in place with, auto, most put in place with automation. Automation alone for this product costs $65 million in insulates last line. On the right is my product, 12 molded plastic pieces in a coin cell battery, ultrasonically welded, designed from the grounds up for lights out manufacturing. We built a pilot line for this. That can that cost six million dollars. That can do seventy million in revs if we put three and a half shifts on it. That's and, hmm? and with manufacturing, don't, you've already lined up a a uh, partner on that, right? About that's right. Yeah, we spent more than more than a year. Uh, more than a year ago, we got a we put Philips Medicide. We signed with Philips Medicize, and Philips Medicize dedicated an entire team to helping us optimize the design of this product to make it more manufacturable. All of our vendors for the equipment 
are validated Philips Metasize vendors. And if you don't know who they are, they're a private company that does $4 billion in annual turnover in, uh, as a manufacturer of medical devices uh, owned by Coke Industries and Molex. And, uh, you know, they were an early partner with Insulate on their first few plants, and they make other insulin carrying devices in their factory, in their factories. So, uh, you know, while we are paying them as a manufacturing partner, I don't think they would have dedicated all those engineering resources and partnered with us so closely if they thought that this was going to be a $3 million a year product or was never going to get cleared. So I think that's a pretty strong endorsement of their, their belief that we're clearable by the FDA at some point. All right, so technological advantage, cost advantage, safe, potentially safer, just as accurate, if not more, easy to use. But none of that matters if you don't have a differentiated sales strategy. And in this industry, the way the products are sold, if you haven't heard this before, is that first you go to your endocrinologist and you say, I would like to go on a pump. And the endo makes you keep a diary for 60 days of all your diabetic events, how many carbs you had, how many units of insulin you had, what your blood sugar was. And they're not doing that because you're a good or bad candidate. If you take daily insulin, you are a good candidate for a pump. They're doing that as a pure proxy for compliance. They're deathly afraid that the insurance is going to buy you a $4,000 paperweight because you will use it for a week and then you will put it on the bathroom shelf and say, you know what, that was really hard. I'm going to come back to that later. <laughs> and then you never do. So then they've lost both ways, right? They bought you the pump and they haven't, and, uh, and it hasn't been deployed. So our plan is different. Instead of D and so, so then, then you're eligible for a pump and then you are put in touch usually with two out of the three of the manufacturers and they often roll a rep to your house. And that rep does a feature and benefit sale at the kitchen table as to why you should use their product. And then they leave with the product. They don't leave it with you. And there are two major reasons for that. One is it's self-fill and you might try and use it and kill yourself because you haven't had the week-long training class that's required in order to be able to use the pump. So it's very dangerous. And two, you might just keep it. And that means you've kept a $4,000 medical device. Even these guys, where you're throwing the thing away every three days still require this, a lockdown controlling cell phone. So they can't leave you with that. And they have the same issue of having a lot of features and a big required training burden. We did a study of 30 multiple daily injectors who had never used a pump before. And we gave them our quick start guide, a dummy cartridge and our reusable and said, what is this and what will you do with it? Eight out of 10 could put it on correctly in less than 10 minutes. That's unheard of usability for a pump. We think that the total training burden, given that we have basically four configurations, because the basal and the bolus are preset by the doctor, um, you know, we think the training burden here is about 20 minutes. Hmm. That's very, very different. And that's that's enough to engage the nurse diabetes educator who can say, look, this patient's been coming in for 13 years saying, I want to pump, but these pumps won't work. Now I can get them out of my office. <laughs> you know, one, one of my favorite examples is that a nurse diabetes educator told me like, look, when, when, I, when someone asks to use it to go on a pump, I ask to see their cell phone. And if it's an early model smartphone or a flip phone, I say, you can't handle the pump. And you can see why if you've ever tried to teach someone how to use technology. It can be really, really burdensome. So a simple, no one's going to call me in the middle of the night and say, I don't understand how this feature works. That's very appealing for this crowd of patients and the people who have to serve them. And we're gonna and we're gonna take advantage of our superior economics to offer first month free. If you don't think this, if you think this might work for you, take it home and try it for free for 30 days. Copay buy downs, point of prescription couponing, all stuff that's done everywhere else in medicine, but just isn't done in pump land right now because of the economics and because people sell on features and benefits. And this is a really concentrated prescribing base. There are only 4,000 endos in the United States who see patients, despite the fact that it's one out of every four healthcare dollars that are spent on diabetes-related issues. And of those 4,000 endos, only 1,500 have ever written a pump. And 1,000 of those write 80% of the pump scripts. And those 1,000 endos are attached five to 10 at a time to a single nurse diabetes educator training practice in the area who teaches people how to use pumps. Those 200 to 250 practices are the people that we need to convince were a viable alternative capture these people who have raised their hand but said this what's available now won't work for me and then we can go after the 2500 endos who have said i'm just not going to deal with pumps so we think it's a compelling story in terms of differentiated marketing we've surveyed a third of the commercial lives in the us and said if we were on the pbm channel and this is this is important to understand too 
major difference besides design of this product versus the others is that it's they've gotten on the prescription drug benefit, which means that there's no upfront for the patient and there's no upfront for the insurance company. Insulet takes the risk on this device, which means, of course, that they probably, if they're giving you this for free, they probably don't break even on you as a customer for more than a year. But, and they up, they upcharge and bundle the cost of that into this, into their, into your every three day wear. So you, you fill this like a prescription, you get 10 of these every month. That's a great model. And the insurance companies are willing to pay a thousand dollars more annually for that model because they don't have the upfront risk. If you stop using it, they stop paying, right? They're willing to pay a thousand dollars more a year versus the other two pumps. And so we went, we surveyed a third of the commercial lives and said, if we want to be on the PBM benefit, just like insulin, given our more limited feature set, how much of a rebate do we have to give you to be equal or preferred day one? And they said, well, 10 to 20% based on the limited feature set. So all of my numbers assume a 20% rebate. That's so they can save $1,000 a year versus insulate. They're not taking the upfront risk. They're not taking on the training burden. If you stop using it, they stop paying. And they're still getting the $10,000 annual savings. Pretty compelling for an insurance company. But what about us? Is it compelling for us? And I would say... Yes, because even with the 20% rebate at scale, and because obviously the first couple thousand units we make, we're attaching $20 bills to them as they go out the door, right? Because of the absorbed manufacturing overhead. But at scale, we should be profitable, excluding cost of sales for us on the first month after that, even with a free month, the first month an insurance pays for it, we should be making money on a customer cash on cash. And in a month where they're just taking 10 disposables from us and not getting another 90 day reusable, should be a 78% gross margin. Those are phenomenal economics in a space like this. What model does that drive? If we get 1% of the people who require daily insulin, 36,000 concurrent users, that should be a $150 million business. And we should be profitable. At a 2% operating margin, or sorry, a 2% market share, 20% operating margin on 300 million in revenues. Once again, phenomenal numbers relative to in a space where, you know, Insulate barely makes money at a billion two in revenue and Tandem doesn't make money at a billion in revenue. So we don't, and, and frankly, we're not targeting their customers. They're addressing a, I don't want to say higher end, but a much more tech savvy, much more feature rich set of customers who are looking for a different level of care than what we're trying to offer. But there's no re there's no technical reason that if you if you were one of those companies and you wanted to pile features on top of our product that you couldn't that you could and you wanted to use it as a platform you absolutely could there's nothing technically different about our product except that it pumps in a somewhat different way that's lower cost and safer et cetera et cetera okay FDA process so this is a predicate device application our predicate device is the tandem T slim the product that Paul designed and got through the FDA. Um, the way the predicate device process works is that you submit to the FDA and say that you are equivalent to that device, that you pump as accurately, as safely, et cetera. No one knows that. No one knows what Tandem's application looked like better than Paul. And, uh, you know, this isn't like a drug application where they come back to you after a year and say, you know what, we'd like you to dose another 500 ovarian cancer patients and see what their overall survival is and come back to us in five years. They don't get to do that. This is, they have to ask us questions about how we are or aren't equivalent to in, in terms of performance to our predicate device. So we submitted on January 19th, and now they have, for this slide, 60 days to respond to us. So on or before March 19th, with a set of questions. After that set of questions, we have 180 days to respond to them. If we can't respond completely in 180 days, then we time out and we have to go back to zero and resubmit. Obviously, we plan on responding much faster than that, but we don't know for sure how long it's going to take because we don't know what all the questions are. So stay tuned. Um, after we respond to the second set of the first set of questions, then they have 30 days to get us a second set of questions or clear us. I feel it's very likely they will ask us a second set of questions. Our submission was 22,000 pages if you paginated it. So it's, it's, it's quite involved. So you, uh, you know, 
but it's but it's sort of an open book exam in that they told us what tests they wanted us to run beforehand. So we're running tests that they told us they wanted, and we're trying to respond to their questions about how the device works. So they have 30 days to give us a second set of questions, and then we have 180 days to respond to the second set of questions completely, just like the first. And once again, you would hope that the set of questions would be smaller on the first on the second go around than the first. And then after we respond to that second set of questions, the way the regulations are written, we're supposed to go interactive, which means that we talk daily, weekly, emails, video calls, conference calls, whatever, in order to clear us with the least amount of commercial burden possible at that point. Hmm. So uh, now, are we average? I don't know, but the average time for an insulin carrying device to be cleared in the last two years by the FDA, by this division of the FDA, was 159 days. It's not a very big N, and we don't know if we're average. And that N obviously includes anything from like an auto injector pen to a full blown pump. So we're just not sure, but that's that's just there just for your own information. Um, what else can we do with the platform since we're talking platform? Um, and I want to be cognizant of time here, but so what else can we do with the platform? So if the, if the FDA got religion and said, instead of having to validate each handset, each operating system and each handset and said, you just have to do the operating system and you could use an app on your phone to manage your pump, we would happily fast follow on that. Our whole firmware team came from Dexcom and did that kind of integration work. So we plan to be a fast follower in that, but we're not going to do the heavy lifting on that. If if you're currently, if you're required to downgrade your phone or have a fully locked down phone because the FDA is so worried about your phone bricking your pump, um, I think most of our users will be comfortable with just using the button. Although we will, ob we obviously have an app that says, you know, that just pushes information to your phone that says, yes, it's working. And yes, you just bolus yourself. You probably don't want to do that again. So this is in development, but we're going to wait and see what the FDA does in terms of getting more progressive about integrating cell phones. The other thing you can do with this platform is the artificial is a version of the artificial pancreas. So um, not to get too technical here, but uh, your body, if you are not a person with diabetes, uses three different hormones to manage your blood sugar. And it's somewhat arrogant of us to think that we're ever going to get an artificial pancreas using only one hormone plus a clever algorithm. So, but none of these three hormones in their synthetic form are the same dosing size, the same pH. None of them play well together. And in fact, two of them, the FDA explicitly requires to be injected at least three inches apart from one another. So that poses a serious issue if you're going to try and put them in one pump. So ours is designed from the ground up to be able to have two or three chambers using 98% of the same componentry for a multiple chamber artificial pancreas style pump. The reason we haven't gone forward with that very far is that even though we, even though it's 95% finished and sitting, sitting in our shop, um, there's no predicate device there. So that would be a brand new approval pathway. And we also think that the FDA would likely require a um, pre-fill because they're not going to let people self-fill three different chambers. If you mix up the drugs and put the wrong drug in the wrong chamber, you die. So, uh, so we, so there are whole, there are issues around prefill. There are issues around uh, predicate device. There are issues around how much testing will be required with two of the three components, one of the three components. You know, how long might that cartridge sit in the fridge if it slipped behind the milk and then the patient pulled it out nine months later and said, "Hey, I could use this." <laughs> so, so we think that's a great market, but we're not ready to address it yet. There are other things you could do with this platform too, in terms of just basic drug delivery for other kinds of drugs. Um, you could put other things in that chamber, like two different kinds of insulin, because human-derived insulin is 90% cheaper. Slow-acting insulin is 90% cheaper than the current, than uh, fast-acting insulin. But nobody puts that in their pump because they want to be able to push a button and eat within 10 minutes. But the slow-acting stuff actually works better for the basal. So you could use a two-chamber pump to do the basal with slow acting insulin and the bolus would be fast acting. And if you pre-filled it, then you would both be in the stream of the drug revenue and you could potentially save 40% on the cost of the drugs, yeah. which might be helpful for a, a certain segment of the population. So there are lots of things you could do with this, with this platform for that reason. Uh, another market we plan to address is Europe. Um, in Europe, pump penetration is in the teens in Germany and it's single digits everywhere else in Europe. Um, 
In the UK, there's a mandate that every pediatric type one should be on a pump. Uh, we've talked to the program manager because currently they're only doing one out of every three kids. We think at the pricing level that we would bring, uh, they could potentially do all the children. So we plan to, we're gonna, we're gonna start the process to submit to the UK um, in the near future. Uh, design validation, we've already talked about Phillips Metasize, the former CEO of Insulet, Dwayne DeSisto, joined our board last July. He's the only human being who's ever launched a patch pump in the US. So we think that's a strong validation. And Gluco, which Mant does the upload download management software in every doctor's office that has Insulet, um, as well as other offices as well, since they also are compatible with Medtronic and Tandem, uh, partnered with us in December. So once again, it's a vendor relationship, but they don't just partner with anyone. They must think that we're going to have at least moderately good market penetration. What are we playing for? Why should you care from a stock perspective? So there have been a couple transactions in the recent past that I think spotlight what a pump that's around clearance or before clearance might be worth. Tandem Diabetes purchased a company called AMF Siggy in December of 22 for $70 million in cash upfront and $143 million in milestones and earnouts. Um, on their call announcing the acquisition, they guided to a late 26 or early 2027 submission. Uh, that would suggest that we are about four years ahead of them. Uh, so I think given our current market cap is around $50 million, that speaks to... Uh, that speaks to potentially us having some value at this level. But more, more inter probably more interesting from a near-term perspective is that Medtronic tried to buy a company in Korea called EOFlow last May. They bid $740 million for a product that wasn't cleared in the US, that was cleared in Europe and Korea, and had less than 5,000 concurrent, 5,000 total users on the platform. Um, in August, Insulet sued them for trade secret theft, patent infringement, and uh, trade dress infringement. And in October, they got a restraining order. And in December, Medtronic walked away from the deal. So I, this, I think this points to, one, the potential value, since this was a clear, this was clearly a very similar product, let's just say that, to an Insulet Omnipod. <laughs> since since the, suit, the suit by Insulet alleged that 65% of the componentry was directly interchangeable, including that they were, it was the same color molded plastic. Um, so we think that any potential acquirer in this space will want to see freedom to operate. Example, you know, that you're pumping in a different fashion than the, guy, than the guys that are currently on the market, A. B, that you're clearable by the FDA, and C, that you can scale the manufacturing. And we think that we have ample evidence in all three of those areas. Um, and so because of that, as, as not only the CEO, but as the PM of the largest shareholder of the company and the guy making a dollar doing this, so I'm entirely incented by the equity, uh, I think it's incumbent on us to, as a as responsible stewards of the asset, to see what an acquirer would or wouldn't pay for this once we get our second set of questions from the FDA. If we see that there's no showstopper here in terms of us getting cleared, so our you know I've been very clear publicly that our plan is to engage a banker to to run a process, see if on clearance we should be selling this, and run an auction or. Um, or raise the $50 million we think to, we need to run to profitability and bring in a commercial, a stud commercial CEO who doesn't want to take FDA or fundraising risk. Yeah. It's part, part of the thinking that <clears throat> regarding m and is that, you know, since a buyer might want to be, have their hand in the commercial rollout strategy earlier than later, that uh, this m and might come at you in uh, early on in this comment um you know, spot with the FDA, these comments. Well, I think, I think they're going to want to know that, that we are going to get cleared. Yeah. So it's got to be, it's got to be a delicate balance there. But I think, you know, it, virtually every potential acquirer I can think of would ha already have some kind of sales presence mm -hmm. and, or want to build it out themselves, which is why we don't plan to invest. You know, we just raised $10 million a few weeks ago, and we think that's enough money to get us to clearance and, to continuing to do our manufacturing build out. So we don't think, not only do we, not only do we think a buyer is gonna want input, but we don't think a buyer will value spend that we make on pre-commercialization activities outside of manufacturing. They might even debit us for that because those are people they would have to get rid of. 
So um, if they already have their own staff. So we plan to spend any incremental capital or if things are going well with the FDA, get more bold about accelerating spend on things that are going to increase manufacturing throughput and margins at launch and beyond. So that's, and, and those tend to be lower cost, but longer lead time items in many cases. So that's, that's where, because that's valuable to me and that's valuable to an acquirer too. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, speak. There's a couple different questions here around the race specifically. Yes, uh, you led. Uh, you led this, or how would you case that? And 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 was it? Uh, so so the fund the fund that I'm the PM of Manchester did ten percent of the deal. Um, the way the release is written, it might be a little confusing. We and we did ten percent because uh, Nasdaq limited us to ten percent. If we did more than ten percent, it would have been deemed to not be a arm's length publicly priced deal. And so you had a number of outside investors, new investors that came into this deal through this public raise. Yes, we did. Uh, we had a number of uh, we had a number of existing investors who I would characterize as uh, billion dollar plus asset uh, healthcare focused funds, and then we had uh, a bunch of new funds that had followed us for a long time or or just got to know us who also have substantial assets, and I think all all of them bought some amount in the aftermarket post deal as well. Uh, it looked like it was, uh, it was a great deal and the, the money you were seeking. I know when we were out in the road shows, you were looking at three to four million and you had I ended up taking in the 10 million, which gets you well past uh, that number. Um, gives you Yeah, well, and, and, and to be honest, we had 27 million in demand. Oh, okay. So, you know, so that was a, uh, yeah, it was, it was a well attended deal. And, and as you know, you know, I thought that our options were, uh, so, you know, when I was on the road before were, you know, use the ATM if the volume is allowed um, and, you know, around submission and, uh, you know, see what, see how many, how many millions we got in from warrant exercises. So we got some warrant exercises. We got a little bit of money off the ATM, but we certainly didn't see the volume spike that we saw last fall, but for instance, when we announced Phillips Metasize. So, um, you know, so we have to do something else in order to bring in a bolus of cash that would give us the flexibility to both sit at the negotiating table with someone else and get over the goal line with the FDA, hopefully. And now there's no real need to use the ATM, I would suggest, for quite some time. And are you locked out of that one? We're locked out for 90 days, and then we can we can reactivate it. And I think I think we will reactivate it just to have it available because that's best practice. You never know what the stock might do. And and you know, if I had more money at a better cost of capital, I would spend it on manufacturing. I can. I have a proposal right now in front of me for $18 million to take my capacity up to something more like 200 million in annual reps. So, uh, and that, that process obviously takes time and that's something that, you know, an acquirer might value because, and I would value, right? Because, you know, what's, what's gonna get you fired in this business? It's, you don't get cleared. It's that you end up with a massive IP headache or, Three, it's three years after you got cleared and you're doing three million in reps because mm -hmm. you can't make the product at a decent price and a decent margin. And we don't want any of those three. So and so what is that from an ownership position now? <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going, but <clears throat> where are you where do you stand in the cap table? Uh so we don't have multiple classes of shares. Everyone in this, everything is common. Except uh, there are some warrants at a dollar twenty-two. There are some penny warrant pre-funded penny warrants at, at uh, you know one point three million penny warrants owned by a single investor who paid three seventy-four for those warrants, and uh, and then we have um, and then we have some warrants up at six sixty. So it's a very simple level cap structure. I own common just like I own common and some warrants up at six sixty just like everyone else. Uh, so I'm, I'm highly incented to do what's right for the common shareholders from a dilution perspective and a capital structure perspective. Okay. Is that the question? Or are you asking me how much I own? Yeah. After the deal? Well, that would be nice to know too. What, what okay. Are... Okay. Uh, it's about, it's about, call it about 11%. Okay. Fully, fully diluted. And again, after this deal, it's 31 million shares, uh, outstanding. I see. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And uh, any other uh, uh, significant owner you would point out 
uh, in the cap structure? So other other owners that you'll see in the filing, Sio Capital, who uh, who owns those penny warrants, who did a deal with us in uh, May of 22. Um, uh, 683 Capital, which is a biotech focused, biotech and healthcare focused fund in New York. Um, uh, Solus is a holder. Um, and then and then the founder, Paul DePerna, is is a uh, mid single digits holder still as well. And I think one of the curious facts that you mentioned about Paul, you know, he's had the success with Tandem and getting that last pump to the market in 2011. Um, mm -hmm. that, and I think Tandem's worth 1.8, 1.9 billion, depending on the day. Uh, and then he had, in the interim, he had a big win outside of diabetes in, uh, I think, where he sold the company for 150 million or the product. That's right. Yes, he did. He did another company, Ivera Medical, which he sold to 3M for $150 million after clearance. And and that that actually that leads to another point that I should highlight, which is that unlike some scientific founders that you'll meet who think this is their only good idea and they'll hold on to it with all ten of their bony fingers, um, Paul is absolutely willing to do the right thing for the asset if the right thing is to sell it yes. and move on and find something else to do or or stay with the asset a little longer and make sure that it works. Yeah. And and obviously. You know, as a PM making a dollar, as a guy who's also a PM making a dollar here, I'm incented to do the right thing for the shareholders, whatever that is. And, um, you know, I think there's very little risk of me being the athletic director who hires himself as the football coach. I, I don't plan to run a sales force. I might, I might go upstairs to executive chairman if we end up launching this ourselves, but I don't, you know, this is, this is not a forever gig for me either. Yeah. It doesn't mean I'm not committed to it, but this is not a forever thing. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's also some competition that might be in the market with new technologies, including um, closed loop insulin delivery. Can you speak to that? Uh, so, so there's a lot of misunderstanding about closed loop. And what we have right now with a lot of companies is what's called hybrid closed loop. So there's still a lot of input required. The FDA has set a pretty pretty firm line in the, in the sand that they're not going to allow a pump and a CGM working together to control your, to dose you without your input at all, unless you can get to a 70% time and range number without announcing sleep, exercise, or meals. Tandem and, uh, and Dexcom in 2019 announced the results of their control IQ trial where they said they had hit 70%, but if you look at the protocol, they announced sleep, meals, and exercise. So that would imply that they're not that close. Um, you know, and once again, I'm not saying that a closed loop system won't eventually emerge, but it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard and it's going to take a long time. And, uh, and we could absolutely be part of a closed loop system because we are not any less capable technically than any of the other devices. We work just as well at a slow flow. We're just as accurate as slow flow as they are. We have, we have Bluetooth, NFC. We have a safe and accurate pumping mechanism, and there's no reason that we couldn't be part of that system. If you ask me, you know, where's modular medical in five to ten years? Where are you going to spend your money? Or you get, do you think that do you think that I'm going to be managing my CGM and my pump using a modular medical app? I would say no. We're happy to sell our data stream to anyone: Dexcom, Livongo, uh, you know, Abbott. Doesn't matter. That's not where we differentiate ourselves. We differentiate ourselves on the hardware because at the end of the day, 10 years from now, you're still going to have to wear something on your body to deliver insulin. And the winner there is going to be best form factor, lowest cost, safest, easy to use and easy to put on. That's kind of where we fit in. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense, uh, Jeb. Um, uh, you know, what, where would you... <clears throat> In this process, it's approximately around six months, right? And you've already got that going into uh, through the FDA. Um, right. Do you do you, uh, there should be a series of milestones that you're probably going to report back to the market as we move along? Uh, how would you lay that out? What would you be? Well, I, I think unfortunately, very very few, or fortunately or unfortunately, very few companies actually report on as they move through these individual steps of the process because it can be confusing frankly like you know that when we get this when we get the last question here 
the questions are probably going to fall into three buckets. The perfunctory, I can't find this table kind of question <laughs> when it's 22,000 pages. The, the I don't understand this, please explain it to me question. And then the very technical, very serious materials. How much, how good were you in terms of handling the molecule that you're trying to deliver? Um, how, how are you preventing artificial accidental release by the patient? And how usable is your product, right? And, you know, how, you, because we had to run a human, we did have to run a human factor study showing how people put the product on in real life. And, and you know, could the FDA ask us to redo some portion of that? Of course they could. Uh, of course, that also doesn't take that much time to redo if they, in, you know, unless we have to re-engineer some portion of the product. But even if we do, you know, those, those aren't showstoppers. Those are things that delay us. If you have the money to survive that and you can solve the problem and it's not, you know, if they have a problem with the way we actually pump insulin, that's a much bigger issue. But we've tried to design our product to overcome the objections they've had to insulin pumps that they have not cleared in the last 15 years of which there have been several well-funded pumps, all of whom pressurize the insulin rather than pumping with negative pressure, which we don't think they like. Let me ask you this. Is there a chance, is there a, a process to, to apply for a breakthrough device designation in any way through this process? Or does Ooh, that... good question. Good question. So, so there is, there is a process. Um, and the first thing I would say about breakthrough is be careful what you wish for, because if you apply for breakthrough status, as it's currently written, you have to show superiority to the current product. All right. And uh, like I, I believe AMF Siggy got breakthrough status pretty early on, um, applied for and got breakthrough status. But if you do that, you have to actually prove it. You have to show that you're superior in, in accuracy or show that you have better occlusion detection. You have to show these things rather than just simply being equivalent. And that is a much, much higher regulatory burden. That's That would be point one. Point two is, though, that the way the regulations are currently written, you must show superiority. And we've always found that to be a really awkward line to walk as far as you're a predicate device, you're asking for the same label as this other device, and yet you're saying that you're superior. Walk me through how that works from an intellectual standpoint. Um, now, on the on the flip side, the FDA did publish draft guidance in October of 22. And that guidance said that there was a new potential new standard for breakthrough, which was ease of use. And the examples they ease of use and access for patients. And the examples they gave were English, someone who speaks English as a second language, who wants an easier to use interface, and someone who has lousy insurance for whom a cheaper product would be more accessible. So obviously, that standard fits us to a T. And if that breakthrough guidance was in effect today, um, we would certainly apply for it. But what you have to know is that there's no timeline on when that goes effective. It's just out there. It's a good indicator of which way the wind is blowing at the FDA, but it's not, uh, but it's, we, they are not bound by it right now. So we can't use it. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> and, um, Someone's brought up a product uh, uh, that's waiting FDA clearance or approval called uh, NIA from Pharma. Pharma yes, yes. Our friends in Beale, Switzerland. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. There are there are a couple products that are actually in the queue. Uh, there's one by a company called Embecta, which is a spinoff of Becton Dickinson. Uh, they say that they're specifically targeting type twos, and that it's a and it's a one piece pump, so it has. You know, I, I I have to confess, I have not seen it in person yet, but my understanding is that it is a one piece pump like an Omnipod. So you're throwing away the electronics every three days, which is going to have an impact on cost. Um, but, you know, I guess, uh, look, this this market needs more choices. So we'll see. We'll see who gets there and how competitive each of their options is. Uh, PharmaSense is a two part pump. Uh, it. Uh, it's made by a small company in uh, Beale, Switzerland, and uh, they, they announced that they were filing with the agency on December 29th. Uh, of course, John, you and I could file with another insulin pump tomorrow if we wanted to. It just might not go anywhere. <laughs> uh, I don't quite know what it would look like, but, uh, you know, there's nothing to stop someone from filing. The question, there, there, are, there are multiple questions behind filing. One is, 
One is, have you done all the necessary testing of insulin stability, the biocompatibility, et cetera? How long will it take you to navigate those questions? And will you encounter a question that would cause you to time out? And, and the answer with PharmaSense is their application isn't public, so I don't know. One. Two, you have to pass the threshold of manufacturing. How many of these can you make? Because there are a bunch of pumps that are cleared in Europe that are not cleared in the U.S., and are probably never going to be cleared in the U.S. because they're made by hand. And a handmade pump will not have good margins and will not be scalable to the point where it's interesting in terms of taking a major chunk of the market. Um, so scalability is an issue. Uh, my understanding, too, is the PharmaSense is a syringe-based pump. So while it's a curved syringe, it is, in order to get into that round form factor, it is um, virtually every pump on the market right now is syringe-based. And syringe-based pumps get their accuracy from machining. When you hear machining, think costly. Yeah, yeah. And then can you also speak to uh, GPL drugs? <clears throat> uh, GLP-1s, yes. Well, unfortunately, we don't have two hours to talk about GLP-1s <laughs> and, and my personal feelings about, uh, about you know, these drugs, which frankly have have great appeal in some ways and, uh, and you know, have, have some issues too, in terms of, uh, so I'd say, I think the key thing to understand about GLP-1s is they're not currently approved for any type one, which is half the market. And if you're a type two, who's gotten to the point where you're requiring a significant amount of daily insulin, they might reduce the amount of insulin that you need, but they won't eliminate that need. So they are synergistic with pumps and if you catch it and they might delay the onset of needing daily insulin if you're a type two, but they won't, uh, they won't bring you back if your pancreas is already so low functioning that you require daily insulin. So I think, might it slow the rate of growth in the type two market? Sure, but remember that nine out of 10 type twos who require daily insulin today aren't wearing a pump. So there's plenty of greenfield there, regardless of the GLP ones, and it's not going to stop the growth in the U.S. or worldwide of the prevalence of pre-diabetes, which is an absolute epidemic. So I don't, um, you know, I don't think it really impacts our market in a significant way. There's, you know, is there an argument that someday if we do a dual chamber device, we could put a GLP one in it? Maybe, but we're going to have to see a lot more data that says that there's an advantage to doing that. Okay, I think that makes uh, that that, that uh, wraps up the questions for today. You kept we kept you a lot longer than I expected, and I appreciate all the people that have participated. Um, uh, Jeb, would you like to just uh, have an ending statement uh, um, that uh, to wrap things up about your product and your revolutionizing uh, revolutionizing diabetes care? Uh, look, I, I guess I guess if the the main takeaway if you've listened to all this, is, is just that there is a huge underserved market here that's been ignored by the major manufacturers for a long time. And it's, it's going to take a different kind of design and a different kind of product from a use standpoint in order, and a cost standpoint in order to access that market. And we think that we're that product. And we think that the, now that we're on the clock with the FDA, you know, the goal line here in terms of being able to get on the market and start to help people isn't that far away, hopefully. Sure. And now we have the money to do it. So, you know, if people want to participate, they're probably going to have to participate in the open market if they want to play the, uh, the potential increase in value. And I guess the one other thing I would say is, aside from the, act, the abortive and successful acquisition activity I already alluded to, there's never been a pump company that was cleared in the United States for this application that didn't achieve a $330 million market cap after clearance. Doesn't mean they always kept it. Yeah. Execution plays a big role too, but but the market is big enough that the market has usually valued this at a much higher level than we're currently valued at. And I think we're pretty credible and, you know, I hate to play the relative value game, but I think we're pretty undervalued versus our peers. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Um, right. just Thanks for setting this up. Absolutely. Um, my, our pleasure. So, uh, note that uh, we're going to try to get Jeb out to around the country and we're going back and, you know, from the San Francisco here all the way out to uh, Miami and back, if you will, uh, these days with our tribe events. And uh, as soon as we can, we'll look to try to get him in your tribe city. If you want him there 
please express your interest in the wish list process at the website or reply to me at any point. Note that this video will be published by the end of the day, if at all possible, at the Tribe Public YouTube channel. And you can review any of these questions and or the presentation today there as soon as possible. Uh, thanks again for you know coming out today, Jeb, and also for all the Tribe members. And uh, look forward to having, having you back soon. Thanks again, and, and good luck in the meantime. Appreciate the opportunity to give everyone an update. Thanks.